Sarah, if we look at the world of religion, we see a cacophony of, of, of conflicting claims. Each different religious tradition has very strong elements that absolutely are incompatible with others. Who is God? Who is God's prophet? What are the rituals that are required for whatever the, the ultimate uh, salvation in each individual religion? Some have said that these are all different ways of looking at the divine. Others have said that I should throw out the entire religious project because of all the obvious contradictions. How do we deal with such different religions in the world? This is a great offense, but I think there are um, some false ways of approaching it, which I would like to suggest that we set aside. The first is that it's a bad idea to think of religions as, as it were, large units with no complexity within themselves. So it could be, for instance, that I have more in common with a certain kind of Sufi than I do with um, a fundamentalist Christian of a certain sort. Mm -hmm. So um, we're not dealing with, as it were, religious units that are simply lined up um, with particular doctrinal um, Positions. See, I would argue that with the Sufi, you would have you would have a methodological a coherence in mm -hmm. terms of, of fluidity mm -hmm. and and uh, openness. Mm -hmm. But on some fundamental issue, we would disagree. Right. Is Jesus God, or, sure. or some fundamental issue that there would still be that ultimate clash? That's right. So the second thing I wanted to draw attention to is. If you simply look at those clashes as, as it were, extrinsic doctrinal incompatibilities, then you're not really getting to the heart of the issue. You're not, you have to probe more deeply than that because you have to look at um, the practices and attitudes and lives that are attending these kinds of propositional assent. It seems to me that much more important than um, the kind of pluralism that you have pointed to is the question of how grown up we are as religious people, how deeply we have imbibed our own traditions. That doesn't just mean by being fanatical, it means by how much we have actually absorbed and been transformed by the tradition that we've inherited. Now, once you begin to look at the relationship between religious traditions in those two different ways, not as slabs of undifferentiated religion, nor as uh, simply a matter of competing propositional forms of assent, then you've got a terrain that is much more interesting, I think, and also, you might say, more complicated. Uh, yes, but, but those are big assumptions. They are, uh, sure. That you, you could make that, uh, uh, make that move. Now, w w are you saying that as you are more transformed uh, in your contemporary life, within your own tradition, then, then in that condition you are more receptive to other religions. I am. And I'm saying that... So that's a strong claim. It is a strong claim. Um, I'm willing to stand by it. I think that the way that we have conducted our comparative religiosity in recent decades has by and large been rather misleading um, and very open to the natural riposte of the skeptic that all we have here is a cacophony of pluralistic voices that are incompatible with one another. Much more interesting is to draw together people of deep spiritual stature from different religions. Put them in a room together and see what comes out of that. Because that's where I think the really interesting commonalities begin to emerge. A deep commitment to peace, a deep commitment to mutual vulnerability and listening, a willingness to learn from the other. All of those things are wonderful for humanity. But all of those things undermine each of the traditions, classical approach to God or, or the rituals of their tradition or the uh, divinity or, uh, of, of, of an individual or the, the, the specialness of a prophet. All of those things disappear if you have just unity of peace and good feeling and general spirituality and, and uh, the harmony of meditation. I mean, th that's a view. Uh, but that's not a um, that's not a majority view of any. No, it isn't a majority view. It doesn't mean it's not right. Sure, because, uh, absolutely. Um, and anyhow, this is only a preliminary 
to a discussion about truth that then emerges from that interaction. So in I my, see. this is where I'm different from the sort of classic liberal pluralist ah. who is happy to say, well, isn't it wonderful that we have all these different traditions? Maybe they all have some kind of access to the truth and we should sit light to the fact of their uh, pluralism. Yeah. That I'm not interested in that at all because it seems to me that the quest for unity in truth is overriding and that we can never get rid of that sense of quest, which is why I'm committed to one religion rather than another because it satisfies me more than these others. And you believe there's a fundamental reality to that difference, I do. not just that it makes you feel better. I do, absolutely. So, so really then you do a two-step process. You say that, look, let's get together people of goodwill and of common spiritual quest together and, and be harmonious together. And then out of that, though, there's a second required step, that those people you believe, you hope, will together discern some truth, in which case you may be modifying your belief. Absolutely. Somebody will have to modify Absolutely. it. In fact, virtually everybody has to, will have to modify their beliefs uh, in, in order to accommodate that, uh, that project. They certainly will. And, but then if you remember my first point, which is that there is so much more complexity and also relative immaturity or relative maturity in the understanding of any one tradition, this becomes more attractive as, a, as an option. So the position neither subscribes to the absolutist presumption that one of these traditions holds the truth and the others don't, nor does it subscribe to the classic liberal pluralism that is often seen to be the only alternative to that. Do you then believe that all people will be saved in however you define the concept of salvation? I have a belief in a God who, in my view, and this is a minority view within Christianity, doesn't give up on God's creation. Now, there may be some people who ultimately reject salvation and go on rejecting it. Um, but the God I believe in is the God who wants the best for all that has been created by God. And therefore, I find it extremely hard to see that anyone is um, eternally set up for damnation. I just find that an extraordinarily difficult idea. It's one strand in the Christian tradition, but it's never one I've been intellectually or spiritually attracted to.